Hello everyone and welcome to Vampires in Gaming. So we are joined today by myself, I'm Lucy, a producer at Aurac Digital, my pronouns are she, her. And we'll kick it off with Victor, would you mind introducing yourself please? Yeah, sure. I am uh, uh, Victor, my name is he, him. Uh, my, I've been a concept artist here at Stunlock Studios who made uh, The Rising uh, released last year. I've uh, been here for about six years. I've been a concept artist for like maybe eight years. Um, and yeah, I'm really into the, the lore of the game and always trying to push for like, can we have more lore? Vampire lore. But yeah, awesome. That's me. Awesome. And Martina? Hi, uh, I'm Martina. I am the community developer for World of Darkness. I'm living in Stockholm, very dark as for now. And uh, my parents are Shide. And uh, yeah, I've been working here for three years now and uh, been in the community of Vampire the Masquerade for about almost 20. <laughs> wow. Big fan then. Yes, huge fan. Absolutely. <laughs> cool. And sticking to the world of darkness, Kenneth. Hi, um, I'm Ken, Kenneth Height, uh, he, him. I'm a tabletop a role-playing game designer. Uh, I think I'm here because of Knights Black Agents from Pelgrane Press and because I was lead designer on Vampire the Masquerade 5th edition from White Wolf. So I've uh, been both Van Helsing and Dracula, I guess, professionally. <laughs> <laughs> and last but certainly not least, Thomas. Hi, uh, Tom. He, him. Uh, so I'm the marketing executive over at Nomad Games, uh, and the latest game that we released was Fury of Dracula Digital Edition, um, which is the digital version of the cult classic uh, horror board game where you got to hunt Dracula across Europe. Um, so yeah. Amazing, thank you. So to kick things off, it's been 125 years since Dracula was first published, and Popular culture seems so far from satiated with drinking the vampire myth. So why, in each of your opinions, does it have such a hold on us in fiction? If anyone would like to kick us off with some thoughts. I do. I can. <laughs> yeah. I did write something down. Uh, no, I think um, I, I think it's been during so long because it's a, it's a power fantasy but it's also like uh, an alluring, almost like sexual thing as well. Like you, you're both powerful and you're sexy. And this has like a wide appeal because it's, it's something very like, you know, deeply intrinsical in our nature uh, appealing to us. Um, so, so yeah. And it's also like every culture has like a vampire thing, like a blood sucking entity. Um, so it's very easy to understand why you would be frightened of something that once you drinks your blood. Um, so yeah, it's like both ends, like it's really easy to understand why they are scary and also easy to understand why you would want to be one because uh, you would be really strong and sexy at the same time. <laughs> Unless you're Absolutely. an Osirato, I guess. Mm. <laughs> I'm sure some people out there, I'm sure he does it for some people. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. It's, it's at at least a ninth here. of people, I From... guess, uh, Martina can, can attest to that. I have to say that Nosferatu, from the clan perspective of Vampire the Masquerade, are considered one of the most romanceable clans in you know, Vampire the Masquerade. People love them. Oh, really? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, cool. But yeah, I feel like there's a big pull, uh, definitely towards the sexy part of Vampire, but also towards so many philosophical questions that the topic of vampirism creates as, uh, do you want to live for eternity? Would you like to live forever? Um, how do you approach morality when sustenance from blood is needed for your survival? And so many other topics which are just so interesting to tackle on individual level from vampire to vampire. And that's why there are so many great stories to explore within the concept of vampire vampirism. I think another oh, reason yeah, is... Yeah, absolutely. And Tom? Oh. I'm sorry. Austria? No, I, I was going to say. I was going to say that I think another reason that vampires are, are so successful uh, and colonize so much attention is that, like uh, Victor said, they're a powerful central motif, but also you can interpret them in all kinds of different ways. So vampires have represented, you know, 
sterile sexuality and hypersexuality. They've represented, you know, um, uh, uh, syphilis. They've represented, uh, uh, you know, rabies, tuberculosis. They've represented, you know, capitalism. They've represented uh, conformist communism. Anything you want in a story, you can make a vampire do that. Um, to some extent, that's part of the genius of the original world of darkness is that it took all of these different vampire symbols and may gave each of them a clan and put them together in a common mythology. But the fact that you can come up with without even trying very hard, nine or 10 different recognizable takes on the vampire that indicates that it's a very, very, very strong uh, uh, theme and a robust one and a, uh, and one that can, you know, uh, sort of shape itself as society shapes. Yeah, you know, we're not in a, we're not worried that vampires are going to lose their cool. They've been cool for you know since 1750, give or take. And <laughs> every time they go out, someone comes up with, oh no, we're going to do vampires as drug addiction, and we're we're right back in it. More vampires. And I think you can't <laughs> do that even with ghosts, much less with other less uh, uh, less fluid uh, monsters. Um, and I think that that's one of the great advantages that the vampire has over other sorts of um you know imaginary creations even dragons you know which uh we as a species have been worried about possibly since before we gained sentience don't have the power that vampires have to do that so i think that's just uh you know maybe that's why they can transform into so many things because they as a myth can also transform into so many things yeah, I was just going to add on to what Kenneth was saying. I think for me, vampires just always represent, you know, the people that are outside of society. It's the people who are doing things like because vampires still have that humanity. They're still more human yeah. than a ghost or a zombie or something like that. But they're doing things that they're not coming out during the day. They're only going out during at night. Whatever size society at the time deems as or that's something that you shouldn't do, something that you shouldn't be involved with, that's what vampires can represent. And I think you're always going to have that. You're always going to have things that society views as that's other, that's different. And I think vampires are just perfect for um, getting that across. Yeah, absolutely. I, I also feel the same about the humanity. I love how human vampires are compared to other monsters like you can have a kaiju and that's a that's a power fantasy for sure but there's something that is so inherently human about vampires even if they are slightly different that mm. i think is just great to tell stories about because they are people and people make for very interesting stories can i just add a tiny thing yeah of course uh just uh what, what kenneth was saying uh like we talked about this at the office recently uh and like we discussed like the broad appeal vampire versus werewolves like it does werewolves have the same broad appeal but they, they don't i guess because we just said if you want to play a werewolf in but as a vampire in like world of darkness you just play a gangrel or a bruja right like you get the feral um thing going um i mean werewolves are a different thing but just trying basically to 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 put more weight on the, the they're so conf um so moldable to different fantasies yeah, both the feral side and the high society side and everything in between. Absolutely. So following on from that, what aspects of vampire mythology have you guys like leaned into in your respective titles? And then is there anything that you've shied away from consciously? Teen drama vampire stuff. <laughs> <laughs> for me shy it away from not, yeah not because i don't like it just because i don't have that much experience with it uh i first encountered vampire stuff and got hooked on it when i read helsing the manga uh, yeah. and you got to know alucard the big bad of that or, or the, the main protagonist i guess but um yeah so so like overpowered complex characters uh are this is more what, like i gravitate towards when i make the the art for v rising instead of um yeah, so instead of, I don't know, like more, less philosophical stuff, I guess. So straight, like power fantasy. Yeah. 
things. This is really interesting because we are on the other hand just going on a completely different tangent and going deeper into the philosophical part and more with more impact on humanity and the human part of vampires. As I feel like a vampire demasquerades in a vast majority is uh, is almost like a game more about trying to retain your humanity than anything else and uh, leaning even mechanically towards that with the fifth edition as uh, each role you make can push you more towards the beast or you're trying to to keep the power from the beast away uh, so yeah for me definitely when i'm playing vampire when i'm making anything vampire related uh, on my own for me it's always about that struggle uh, the eternal struggle and how badly all of the vampires deep inside want to stay as close to humanity, even though they make decisions which lead them towards um, towards the, the doom in the end. And because uh, no no vampire truly lives eternally, and uh, it's I feel it's a it's a very interesting pull from a variety of people in our community as well who gravitate towards vampire and tackle the subject in a variety of different ways. Some of them, yes, they do play older characters, more powerful characters, while still retaining this their own way of trying to be still human or at least their own interpretation of what human still means because the older you are the wider that interpretation goes so yeah in vampire and masquerade both mechanically and in our products we always try to tackle the topic of uh, humanity dwindling humanity and how your decisions put you further and further away from being human and the more powerful you get and the more you use these powers the further away from what the what the human you were you go, so yeah. Um, interestingly, uh, I mean, I I found out about vampires by watching, you know, Dracula movies uh, on Sunday afternoon horror theater in uh, Oklahoma City in the seventies. So that was that was when vampires became a thing to me. So I've basically imprinted on Christopher Lee and Bela Lugosi and never looked back. But the um, interesting thing about what Martina was saying is that uh, Vampire the Masquerade, when it came out in 1991, so very powerfully affected what tabletop games thought of vampires that I consciously designed Knights Black Agents to push back against that. Because, of course, uh, Knight, uh, Vampire, when it's played correctly, or played, I think, uh, as intended, as Martina points out, is about you know, clinging to your humanity and you become a sympathetic character, if only in your own mind. Um, and there was a lot of other media, uh, not just the Vampire Diaries, but we had, you know, Buffy falling in love with Spike and other, uh, you know, uh, sexy vampires that everyone liked and they were really good. And I thought we need to go back to vampires as the threat, as to Dracula, to this one vampire will destroy the British Empire if he's left alone. Uh, and I, I wanted to write Knights Black Agents to sort of take vampires and make them not the outsider threat that Thomas talked about, the, you know, the, the despised other, but the feared other, the, you know, the conspiracy, the, 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 the surveillance state, everyone that is out there uh, messing with your life. Uh, vampires uh, to Stoker are not just, you know, foreigners from the Balkans. They're also an old aristocracy with um, uh, continental money behind them. They're a, they're a whole different kind of problem. And presenting this sort of uh, vampire conspiracy that in response to sort of as a dance with Vampire the Masquerade, uh, they had the Camarilla, which of course is this gigantic globe-spanning vampire conspiracy. And I said, that's a great game idea, but I want to play the guys who hunt them. And that's what Knights Black Agents became. And then, of course, when uh, I was recruited to design Vampire, uh, they said, uh, would you like to design Vampire? I said, I, I think you've seen my previous work. I'm, I'm Team Van Helsing. And uh, Martin uh, Erickson at the time, who was uh, the guy uh, pitching me, said, yes, we know you've already written the new Vampire. We just want you to write it again from the Vampire perspective. And so I sort of... <laughs> you know, had to sort of take my response to uh, Mark Ryan Hagen's original vision and then flip it over and say, if I'm sort of channeling Mark, how do I respond to my response? And that's what my Vampire the Masquerade uh, 
take was and, and the mechanical changes that I thought it needed to sort of, uh, you know, clean up and, and move into the 21st century. And uh, with a great deal of help from Kareem Muammar, my main co-designer, um, then I think that we we accomplished it mechanically. But I think on, in terms of theme, it was an interesting, uh, you know, I, I got to be both sides of that uh, argument of that discussion or that um, or that tango, I guess. I was going to say, um, so for us, uh, with Fury of Dracula Digital Edition, um, it was a bit of a weird one because obviously we're doing an adaptation of a physical board game, which already has a theme, which already is established. So for us, it was looking at, okay, well, what theme, what ideas can we take that fit with what we're already working with? Because obviously the physical board game doesn't have music, and it has some artwork, but you need to do all the map theming around that. So with so many different ways that you can interpret vampires, we had to really nail down, okay, well, which interpretation actually fits what we're going for with Fury of Dracula Digital Edition. And I think we really lent into the classical aristocracy um, theme of it. Like Dracula has been around for ages. We had loads of classical music. We really looked at the old um, Hammer Horror movies because it, the original board games from the 80s. So we had to lean into like that particular flavor of vampires. Um, but I think we managed to, we had loads of different options, but at the end of the day, you do have to fit with what the original board game is like. But I think we managed to expand on what that put across um, in a really nice way. At least I think so. I agree. The vibes are absolutely fantastic in Fury of Dracula. Nice. So to move on then, Kenneth, a question for you. So why is it that you've incorporated vampires into so much of your work? Because as you said, you've got quite a prestigious output of vampire related works. <laughs> I mean, I think some of it is just, like I said, I've been a monster kid since uh, forever. And horror has always been both my, you know, preferred genre. And I think ever since playing Call of Cthulhu in the 80s, it's been my notion of the sort of best and highest and most fun kind of tabletop gaming for me. And if you're going to do horror gaming on the tabletop, you're going to be, you know, for all the other reasons we discussed, vampires are going to show up, especially after 1991. So some of it is is my own interests in horror some of it is where the market is uh people love vampires and you know my cat's got to eat um so <laughs> I, I need i need to sell games and i could come up with a really amazing game where you play you know um uh, a pichasha uh, an indian garbage eating ghoul but no one wants to play an indian garbage eating ghoul or even think about an indian garbage eating ghoul because it's kind of disgusting so we'd really rather have vampires thanks I get it. Um, I'd rather read about vampires and, and play with vampires. And, and I think that's, that's sort of a, a push pull, um, a happy, uh, happy confluence, if you will. And then a, a lot of it is just uh, that, uh, like you said, there's been so much, uh, uh, you know, aspirational and identification material with vampires, uh, you know, not just in gaming, but in all kind of media that I think that if you're playing a role-playing game, you're going to wind up, someone's going to say, can I be the vampire? Can we deal with a vampire? You know, uh, Strahd basically got a whole Dungeons Dragons subline uh, oh, yeah. uh, because he's so uh, magnetic and cool. And so, yeah, I mean, if Strahd can do that to D&D, what hope do the rest of us have? <laughs> completely fair, completely fair. And I, I definitely am a sucker for vampires as well. So, Victor, um, we'll come to you next. So, V Rising has become an absolute phenomenon with this open world take on the vampire experience. So, what are the roots of the concept, and why do you think it's kicked off the way it has? As for the roots, I, I actually talked about uh, <clears throat> this with our creative creative director, Arden, where like when we were developing like the new the, a new uh, game, a new idea. Uh, 
for like the gameplay side it's they think like there's they want to have magic in the game because it makes a lot of the game mechanics much more easier to explain like if you teleport or something it's a lot harder to do that with like realism and stuff mm. so so we wanted magic uh and then i think it, because he, the first season of castlevania had you know the animated series had come out uh and he had watched that and he pitched like this this thing like how about we instead of like food we use blood for like the hunger meter right so it's a very established survival game mechanic mm -hmm. and, and another very established thing is the cold areas you can't go on this mountain because it's cold and you don't have any furs um and we could do the same thing with the sun the like uh gate areas by using the sun and we don't have to explain why you drink blood or why you're afraid of the sun because everyone knows how vampires work um and i i have to admit i wasn't very sold on the idea when they pitched it i was like my just dracula chop chopping wood and building a cabin what is this like it doesn't fit with my like you know power fantasy yeah. of the of the vampire but you know it, it really got uh it, it grew on me like yeah this could work you're at least you're a star vampire you, you start from scratch again you know um and as for how why it has been such a phenomenon i think it's because we check so many boxes of like what people think they what they want to do as a vampire like can i build a gothic castle yes uh, can i turn humans into my minions yes uh, do i sleep in a coffin yes um do I, i'm afraid of the sun i drink the blood of my enemies and absorb their powers uh and slowly building my empire and take over the world like we check all those boxes um i so i think that's one of the reasons why it became so so um appealing like easy to explain and you get what you wish for when you're a vampire Absolutely. So is there a particular moment during development where you were like, yes, this is it, vampires? Like when we decided we're going to go for the vampires? Like or... when you were sold on the idea, like absolutely 100%. Oh, yeah. Uh, maybe yeah, maybe when they got the, the first, like, uh, you know, first uh, prototypes going with like using like... Um, uh, so we could actually see the game. We had like a vampire that ran around in a world, like a, an ethereal world with like floating rocks and stuff. And he 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 built his castle by like raising rocks uh, from the ether, constructing new uh, places of the castle, pieces of the castle. Uh, and I just made me thought like, yeah, okay, this this could be quite cool, you know. Um, that's not what we ended up with, but, but like this whole building thing and like showing like having like uh, your minions walk around in the castle uh, and go out and raiding villages, sneaking around. It's just that really, that was like a, maybe 25% into development that like really nailed it, I think. Like, yeah, this is going to be great. Awesome. So staying on the topic of computer games, Thomas. So Nomad Games did the digital edition of Fury of Dracula. What attracted Nomad to that title in particular? Well, as a studio, we've had quite a bit of success previously with um, taking especially older board games uh, and then turning them digital. I think partly because like Fury of Dracula, the physical edition has been out of print for a while and it's quite hard to get hold of, but a lot of people have heard that it's very good. So once you have a digital version, you're like, oh, I don't need to scour um, the dark corners of eBay and the internet to try and find a physical version. I can just get a digital version. Um, but I think the theme as well really sold us. Like the idea of a asymmetrical board game where one of you is playing as Dracula and four of you are playing as the Hunters um, just fit really well. And it's not something that we ever done before. Um, so we're really excited to try and implement um, that kind of gameplay. Um, but it was mainly the theme, to be honest. Like we'd done quite a lot of um board game board game adaptations that were more traditional fantasy or a bit more on the um not the cute side of things but a bit more relaxed whereas this was proper like if you get into a fight dracula's going to be biting you in the neck and you're going to be punched him in the face trying to get him off you like it's more intense than we've done before um so yeah, I think the main thing that attracted us to it was the theme. Um, also, it's a really old game by um, our friends at Games Workshop. Um, back in the day, they used to do board games as well. And occasionally they're like, oh yeah, those exist. Would you like to do something with it? Um, which we were very happy to do. 
Um, and yeah, after having played quite a lot as Dracula and the Hunters in Fury of Dracula, I think it gets across not only the feeling of spreading your influence as Dracula, like in the original um, novel, but also the Hunters desperately trying to take him down. Um, I think it does it really well. Absolutely. So, Martina, we'll come to you next. So, VTM is an absolute classic in tabletop gaming, both digitally and physically. So, being a community developer, what does the community hunger for in the game that keeps its legend growing and growing? It's, well, they, they hunger for many things, just like vampires hunger for many things, except for blood, I guess. But uh, I'd say that the biggest pull that vampire always had and still has on the community, just in a little bit of a different way as generations change, is the way of having your own custom vampire, which you can partially identify with, which you can just craft towards your personal experiences or towards whatever you want your character to be. Uh, the clans were a very easy way of discern vampires from each other and to pick that one which fits you most. That identification is something that was extremely important to people back in the 90s and it is important to people now, uh, especially to uh, people who are um, who are you know still like getting into various uh, TTRPGs or various different uh, universes where there's always like a way to pick a side. There's a way to um, choose so, like your class, your character class, or your way of playing the game. And that's what the vampire clans are doing in Vampire: The Masquerade. So clans are definitely a big, big pool. But except for that, I feel like Vampire: The Masquerade always had a variety of ways to play your vampire fantasy. So your personal, like, every one of us, as we mentioned, has different um, approach to uh, what kind of a media, pop culture media we've watched or consumed when we were younger when it comes to vampires. Some of us went into the hobby with, uh, with the books or with uh, into the vampire and... I'm super sorry, my toddler is in the house. <laughs> and so, some of some of them also got into the hobby because of True Blood or later on with uh, Vampire Diaries or with things which are more aimed for the younger audience. And each of these people can find their vampire in Vampire the Masquerade, can make someone who realizes their own fantasy of being a vampire. Is it to be this sort of a humane vampire who is very sexy, who tries to cling to this humanity very badly? Or is it someone who really like lies on this very low levels of humanity and tries to get this higher power becomes more of a count with your own metaphorical or physical castle um that you um, guard like the the armies of of your bats from there's each of these fantasies can be realized within the counties of Vampire the Masquerade. So I think it's interesting to explore how different people approach to it. Definitely for the newer generations and new people coming into the Vampire the Masquerade, the humanity aspect is a huge selling point and it's something that they cling to the most. And uh, yeah, I, I feel like we're going to see different uh, versions of how Vampire the Masquerade is interpreted as the time goes on. And I don't think that there's ever going to be a time where we're going to run out of stories. Yeah, absolutely. I ended up with an entire coterie of people searching for Golconda in my game. Nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're that, not doing a very a good job of it so far. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I, I do role play as a lower humanity celebrate currently who just like really doesn't like being celebrate <laughs> so it is it is a very interesting uh, way of, of mixing and matching you know what is really um like interesting to you for you to explore for me for example like i love exploring characters which are troubled which um may want to be humane but do not always are able to do so because of variety of bad choices they make. I like making bad decisions in Vampire the Masquerade and suffering the consequences of it because this is one of the games which has really great consequences if you don't do things well. So yeah, I, I feel like Vampire the Masquerade is one of these games which you don't really play to win. And uh, that's what for me is a huge selling point too. But uh, of course, some people are dwelling in a little bit of a different uh, side of there and becoming more of a powerful vampire who try to get those titles and to be respected in their communities. And I feel like uh, th there's a room for all of these stories. Amazing, thank you. So that's all the questions we had, but we do have some more. So I'll just open the floor. 
does anyone have a favorite um, game vampire, media vampire? Just one, one vampire that you just absolutely love. I do. Oh, I, I actually. Um, yeah, sorry. Come let's on, nerd you... out. <laughs> Geek out. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, um, Victor mentioned the Netflix Castlevania yes. um, show earlier, and that's a very good Dracula. I yeah. really yeah. enjoy it. It Heck is also yeah. amazingly animated, which helps a lot. Um, but yeah, just as a representation of Dracula as this sort of misunderstood scientist who is willing to do anything just to increase the knowledge that he has of... It's just a desperate search for more knowledge and the length that he's willing to go through. And just for making him a villain who you can understand exactly what his motivations are makes him so much more compelling to watch. Yeah, I remember watching the first season and being like, that was justified. But he absolutely deserved to do that. Good for him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I already called you guys mine. It's uh, probably Alucard from, from Helsing, especially the animated Helsing Ultimate, where they like remade the anime and and went just along with what the books uh, the narrative of the narrative of the books because alucard is such a, like a, he's he will always be stronger than whatever the bad guys can throw at him uh but he's all, also like this wild card guy like he does whatever he wants sort of but he also has the his master uh victoria integra helsing uh who he has like enormous respect for and does whatever she says um so I don't know, like this, this like dichotomy of being really powerful and a bit like weird, like Dracula, Castlevania Dracula. He was also a really good example of this, like a, a, a complex character who is more like into what, the why rather than the how, you know, like because he, he knows how to do anything. But he is like, but why am I doing this? <laughs> um, I, I, I talked about, you know, Christopher Lee's Dracula as the Dracula that sort of I imprinted on in Bela Lugosi because I didn't know the difference when I was 10, but, uh, you know, to sort of out myself, the, the, the romantic vampire that I liked best, uh, was the Comte de Saint-Germain, uh, in the novels by Chelsea Quinn Yarbrough. Uh, and I don't know if anyone else read these, but they're sort of historical romances. And the Comte de Saint-Germain is a historical character who was sort of an imposter and an alchemist and a con man. Uh, but the con that he told was that he'd been alive for 2000 years and he never needed to eat food and he didn't like to go out by day. And uh, Chelsea Quinn Yarbrough heard about this guy and said, what a great character for this historical novel I'm writing about a vampire. And then about halfway through, she said, oh, he's the vampire. I get it now. And then <laughs> he's sort of, he's in that story and he's in a bunch of other stories. And so it's always, uh, in, in this case, He's the aristocrat, but the aristocrat as the repository of civilization and breeding. He's always older and more uh, and smarter and classier than everyone around him. And so I think, you know, if you're talking about self-identification vampires, Martina, I think that's why I've always been a Tremere in my heart, is I want to be the smart vampire who, who knows stuff that other people don't. Uh, that's the other half of the Nosferatu, I guess, uh, Lucy. But the... Um, but the uh, the notion of, of, of Centurman, and so there's always some historical bad guy doing something awful, and eventually Centurman, he doesn't want any part of this. He doesn't, you know, drink people's blood for fun or whatever. He He's trained himself to, to drain their emotional energy instead. But every so often he's like, well, I guess I have to solve this problem, and I'm a vampire. And it's, uh, it, it's very much, in, in a way, it's sort of almost a classic Western in that he's, He's, he doesn't want to pick up the gun. He doesn't want to be the best gunfighter in the world, but I guess I have to. And in that same way, he's like, well, I, I guess I'm a vampire. I have to explain why it's wrong to be so mean to that nice lady. And here we are. And it's it's completely against everything that I do with vampires. I think in anything I've ever written or or designed, but it's uh, it, it was a it was a part of the vampire sort of uh, quality that I really, uh, I really, I mean, also she's a terrific writer, which I think is another secret weapon that vampires have is that they just have the best writers. 
Um, <laughs> there's never been a good werewolf novel, or at least there's never been a great werewolf novel, right? There, there's, but there's, we're spoiled for choice of, of great vampire novels. Um, and, and so I think that the, uh, the, the Comte de Saint Germain actually is, is a vampire that sort of, you know, I guess like a vampire, he got in there and he mind controlled me and, and I'm still, you know, doing his bidding somehow by making all of his crude rivals look bad. <laughs> They put him in the Castlevania show, right? But he's not a vampire. Right. He's like yeah. an alchemist. Because he's a historical alchemist. He's a, a real historical character. But that's it's so cool. I'm sure that, you know, uh, is it Warren Ellis that's the developer of the new Castlevania? I mean, I'm sure he's he did that as a as a reference, right? He's like, mm. we're we're dropping yeah. that Easter egg for for, for <laughs> people like Ken, who read Chelsea Quinny <laughs> Arbor in the eighties. Nice. Um, as for my fascination, uh, I jump from one to the other, really, because there's so much vampire media to consume. <laughs> I still like, um, I need to like dig. Now, now I'm really interested in that book that kind of mentions, and I really want to read it. But uh, one of the recent ones that I've been really, really into, and I absolutely love what this show did, is the AMC's Interview of the Vampire, um, the new interpretation of Unrised. Uh, that's, you know, we, we probably all watched the old movie. And uh, the book was, of course, great, but I never remembered in the in the book. I, I never remembered reading it for Louis. I read it for other characters. Like the other characters are sort of like more interesting to me always uh, in Anne Rice. While in AMC's interview with the vampire, Louis is absolutely breathtaking. It, just a, an amazing uh, like creation uh, from from Anderson, the actor who who played him. It just like wonderful exploration of a theme where as a human he was a bad guy and now as a vampire of course he is a monster and he's still a bad guy but i feel like he has a way more of a uh like like he he's aware of his own sins way more as a vampire than he was as a human he has a really realization of what being a monster really means and it's being played in such a wonderful way in such a emotional way in almost every scene that uh, that he is in that I, I just can't take my eyes away from his performance it's great and i feel like all the three characters um the, the main ones in the in the first season which is celestat claudia and louis they're all uh, very great interpretations of Anne rice's work which just put a fresh new spin on it that i haven't uh, uh, i haven't expected uh, before and and i uh, it rekindled my love towards this, the, the the whole uh, and rise vampire yet again and i'm very much into it i can recommend it uh, wholeheartedly especially to everyone who wants to explore this more uh, becoming a monster part of a vampire it's super interesting yeah absolutely i think claudia is my favorite the idea of a grown woman being trapped in a child's body is definitely something that yes. i've incorporated into my vtm games She's amazing. I, I love her performance as well. It's like the, the whole energy also between the characters and yeah. how they resonate with each other is, is great. Amazing. Well, I think we'll close it there. We kind of answered all of our other questions as we went, which is fantastic. So does anyone have anything they would like to close on? Apart from go read more vampire fiction. There's <laughs> far too many things that have not been read. That's right. When I, would... um, I was reminding myself of the question of, oh, what other vampires' depictions of Dracula do I really like in media? I was like, oh, there must be a list somewhere online of all the <laughs> things that Dracula's appeared in. Massive, massive, beyond a massive list. But I think my favourite one that I've spotted, didn't know this existed until I had to look into this for this panel. Uh, there was a game called Drax Night Out, it was meant to come out for the NES, in which Dracula has to save um, Mina in the castle. It's a bit, bit weird once you know the law, mm -hmm. but it's a <laughs> partnership with Reebok. So all the things that we've talked about where Dracula's like, oh, I could represent this, you could represent this. You can also just use them to promote shoes. <laughs> so, I love it. It's a very, very versatile um, medium, if that's anything to prove. Well, I mean, we've gotten this far without a shout out to Count Chocula. So, yeah, I mean, that's, true. that's, that's very true. Talk about life changing oh, yeah. vampires to all of us, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, if you if you talk about like uh, you like taking the Dracula vampire thing in a new light, they do that a lot in anime. Like the Japanese, they just go crazy 
with uh, whatever they can get their hands on. Uh, so like you have the you have the JoJo's Bizarre Adventure anime where you have the vampire Dio, who's like the most over the top villain ever. I can't believe I didn't think of Dio. He's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, he is, right? And you have like the vampire vampires who drink just the blood of other vampires called the pillar men who have like super weird powers and, you know, and tons and tons of games. Of course, you have vampires in The Witcher and you have fighting games like Guilty Gear who have like the nightless who are, they are called, uh, which is like you have a posh guy with a pipe and you have a huge black guy samurai who is also a vampire, like a blade on stereo, st- steroids, basically. Let's not forget uh, when it comes to anime and Japanese um, pop culture, the re- reverse vampires. There was, I think, it was called Karin or Karin. Yeah, Karin was the anime <laughs> where there was like a except there was a vampire family and there's a vampire girl in that family that instead of taking blood, she gives blood away through her nose. <laughs> <laughs> she's she's oh, yeah. very emotional. She just like has a nosebleed and oh, she's no. a vampire. So yeah. Let's not forget, like, a kid's show, like uh, Adventure Time. They also feature a vampire. They do. A lot. Oh, yeah, Marceline. Yeah, yeah. of course. Mm-hmm. And she doesn't drink blood, right? She, she drinks does. red stuff. She drinks the color red. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I love that. It's such a, like, kid-friendly way of yeah. using the cool vampire idea, but not in a really scary way. I mean, this is, yeah. this is a show where a uh, talking peppermint candy is the scariest monster. So yeah. <laughs> you're obviously... Yeah, and a penguin. <laughs> <laughs> You're obviously dealing with a whole different level uh, than we're normally that's... used to doing. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, and if you want a more lighthearted take, what we do in the shadows is an amazing series, mm-hmm. which is Absolutely. often what my Vampire the Masquerade games turn into. <laughs> <laughs> I think so every Vampire bad. the Masquerade right. game has something from what we do in the shadows. Yeah, right? like every every game, like a little bit. <laughs> But Lucy, when you said um, that we can end on a note of let's watch more vampire media or consume more vampire media, I also feel like I would love for more people to create their own and yeah. make their own spins of vampire myth because there's just so much more to explore. I feel like with every every generation's experience and our struggles and you know the, it, it kind of reflects in the in the myth of the vampire and how the particular time and era interprets that uh, myth in the pop culture. So. I am looking forward to what the future is going to bring with more creators going into the world of vampire and making the first spin on it. Absolutely. We're getting two Dracula movies this year, right? We're getting yeah, a Nicolas yeah. Cage Dracula and we're getting oh, yeah. um, uh, the uh, uh, Demeter, uh, the Voyage of the Demeter as a, as a sort of a, te- uh, a thriller, you know, um, snakes on a plane, but it's a boat and it's a vampire. Oh, wow. That sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's an elevator pitch. Yeah. Just something that occurred to me when we were talking about why werewolves or ghouls or anything else hasn't have the had the the uh, you know punchiness as vampire. Like vampires have a they have a name. They have Dracula, right? I don't think the other as a Frankenstein, which is like the professor, but everyone thinks it's a monster. But it's a name. Like werewolf, they don't have a name, right? They don't have a character that you can attach the fantasy to. Yeah, and that's. And I think that. I mean, that's part of them not having had a great public domain novel. In the same way that, yeah. you know, Dracula and Carmilla and um, uh, not public domain, but also Lestat really are. Oh. Um, and we don't have a, a great, you know, the the novel, the, the Werewolf of Paris, which is the werewolf novel everyone always quotes to me when I say there are no great vampire novels. It's not about a, a werewolf. <laughs> it's about a it's about a ghoul. It's about a guy who eats corpses. Um, so he's, you know, hmm. like a junior vampire. He's a terrible werewolf. Um, but I mean, I think the best sort of iconic werewolf is Larry Talbot from The Wolfman. Yeah. Because he's got that pathos mm-hmm. and that, you know, heartbreak and poor Lon Chaney Jr., uh, you know, just living out the, you know, horrible, edible conflict that was his life in that film. Um, but uh, Larry's not in public domain. And, you know, once you've watched The Wolfman, you're kind of done with it. Whereas Dracula is, as, as we've talked about, endlessly plastic. Uh, I did a book, uh, The Thrill of Dracula, which was just about film versions of Dracula uh, and just about ones that sort of stuck sort of to the original character. And I, that was like 42 movies and I didn't get through anything like all of the Dracula movies, much less all the other really cool, great vampires. So, uh, I mean, we're in luck that Bram Stoker, you know, um, uh, 
uh, wrote his one masterpiece about a vampire instead of about you know the snake lady under the hill. You know, imagine <laughs> imagine if Dracula had been the crazy, weird, drugged out novel, and Lair of the White Worm had been the masterpiece. Then where would we be? We'd all be doing a panel about snake ladies, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I- I gotta say one thing about the whole vampire versus werewolf discourse, though, which is interesting when you look uh, at it from a completely different perspective of the younger audience, is that um, there is one sort of like genre of literature in which vampire uh, rivals with werewolves still, and there's still a lot of need for both and that is the romance novels Mm -hmm. there's a lot of people Mm. reading werewolf romance novels and a lot of people reading vampire uh, romance novels and i feel like in it's partially because of the twilight uh um pop culture craze that we had uh, a decade ago uh, which maybe created those two camps out of people who are now entering their 30s or in their late 20s and they are consumers so i think it's interesting to observe that maybe there is still some some room to explore both and uh for them to rival each other on a maybe a more equal stance in the future when these people are going to move on to write novels and write more advanced um pop cultural um works that are based on these myths so i i wouldn't cross out werewolves fully i feel like there's still a big rivalry to to be had when it comes to uh werewolf versus vampire uh, but even in twilight you know who she winds up with is the vampire she does it is (laughs) but team jacob is also big i mean yeah but they're 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 like you know they're like cubs fans they're like we're we just root for losers sorry we that's we are that's our identity well, maybe werewolf is the future outsider, <laughs> while vampire is going to be the future mainstream. Right. Yeah. <laughs> maybe That'd be an interesting way to look at it. Maybe we'll have to compare numbers when Werewolf the Apocalypse comes out. That's right. Cross exactly. fingers. I, yeah, I am very much looking forward to to how people, uh, how younger people are going to interact with that too, similarly to how they do with vampire nowadays. Awesome. So thank you, everyone, and you heard it here, guys. Go make more vampires. And if you are interested in anything that these wonderful people have made, you can find links down below.